Welcome to Health Center from Downstate Medical Center. I'm Dr. Gerald Eves. Today we're going to talk about a very important part of doctoring. You know, doctors means to teach, as that word goes around. It means to teach. It's not, it's not being a medical doctor. It's a, you're a teacher. And uh, I remember even in my Sunday school classes, you know, Christ was a teacher, you know. And, there were, and he did more than just healing. He had to heal the mind and body. Because we do have a mind and we do have a body. If you don't think you have a mind, just say something embarrassing and see how blood rushes to your face <laughs> uh, and the warmth that takes place. Can you imagine a matter of mi uh, less than a minute, blood vessels open up and blood rushes to your face, to what you can see. But it doesn't only rush to your face, it rushes to your heart. It rushes to all parts of your body. It's not just the vessels in your face or your heart. It's uh, all over your body. Uh, and so therefore, uh, stress can cause these same kind of things. And you can imagine in a hospital what stress is really like. I, I remember Norman Cousins, uh, the great phys uh, he was not a physician, but he was a, a doctor. Uh, he said that he was in an intensive care unit and a room. He had all kind of arrhythmias of his heart. His heart was jumping all over the place, and they said he, he has serious heart disease. He said, wait a minute. He said, uh, let me get out of this hospital. He said, uh, give me a monitor to put on, and I'll go home. So he went home and went on a hike, mm. and uh, his heart was perfectly normal. <laughs> no more arrhythmias. But as soon as he entered that intensive care, it jumped all over the place. So all you need is a little adrenaline coming out of that gland, we call the adrenal gland, and that heart will jump. And so therefore, uh, we want to keep a patient when they come in the hospital as calm and easy as possible. And doctors don't always do it because we have a thing called white coat hypertension. As soon as they see a patient sees a white coat, their blood pressure goes up. And so they think they have high blood pressure, so they give them some medicine, which gives them side effects, and then they really get sick. And so what we want to do is prevent those kind of things by having a chaplain service in a hospital pastoral care uh, while they're here. Uh, which is just as important as the doctor going around making rounds, that pastor makes their rounds as well to ease that patient into becoming well. And today we have uh, um, Reverend Sharon Walker, who is the head chaplain here at Downstate Medical Center, who I've seen grow through the years that I've known her, and even through the point where she stopped and had her little baby, and it came back, yeah. and she's still strong again. So I want to welcome you. Reverend Walker. Thank you very much. <laughs> Good to be here. Yeah, Good you Reverend Walker. You. you know, I, I you, you could be a Reverend. I, I don't. You could be a Reverend in a church. You could be a Reverend in the street. You could be a Reverend any place you want to be, missionary and so forth. But you chose to be a Reverend in a hospital, pastoral counseling and things like this. But just to get a little bit of your background, where you're coming from, where you were born. You, uh, who impressed you as your little girl coming up to you? You would ultimately be here at Downstate Medical Center and, uh, and be a mom and a, uh, a chaplain and everything at the same time. How did it all start? Oh, it all started way back <laughs> when I was a young girl. Uh -huh. I was actually born in Kingston, Jamaica. Okay. And migrated to the United States at about age four. All right. Lived in Brooklyn all my life. Right. Lived in Brooklyn all my life. Single parent household. Uh -huh. And one of the things that my mother always impressed upon me was that we are our brothers and our sisters' keeper. All right. And so from a very young girl, I knew the importance of standing with, being with others, and walking with people through right. whatever it is, whatever right. the changes, challenges, sickness, dilemmas are. Went to high school here in Brooklyn, John Jay High School. Okay. Then went on over to John Jay College. Yes. And during my college years, I, I, I drew to what I believed to be a call into ministry. I thought I was going to be a criminal defense attorney, right. but God had other plans for me. Uh -huh. And then went into ministry, trained over at Union Theological Seminary there. Which is a wonderful place. Absolutely. I was Reverend, stretched. Reverend Forbes and all those people. Absolutely. Yeah. The best. Yeah. The best. And so going and riding on some of their coattails, hearing them, hearing their voices, having them strip me. Uh -huh. to hear their voices as well as God's voice uh -huh. in terms of a call right. and this mission. Graduated from Union with promise of excellence in parish ministry. Oh. So while I pastor as well uh -huh. as I pastor here in this village of care, right. um, it just seemed like a very natural thing mm. for me to do because mm. all of the folk we have in church end up in the hospital. That's right. Certainly. Very same people. Certainly. You very know. same. And you have that spirit thing that's going on you know when I was talking about spirit I was just 
reading in the book of Hebrews just this morning about the spirit, you yes. know, that uh, thing that we don't understand, but if you get it, it will help you get well. Absolutely. <laughs> You Absolutely. Know, it's not something you can take up and drop and pick it up when you want to pick it up. It has to be a constant presence. Absolutely. You know, that are uh, that that you are being taken care of. Absolutely. You know, and just by mere fact that you are um, are in a hospital and you need that kind of care, here you are now at Downstate Medical Center, uh, doing this pastoral care. But it's not just care of the patient in the hospital, it's, it's care for the relatives that are coming to the patient, to see the patient. I'm sure Absolutely. you have as much a, uh, way with, to deal with the families as well as with the patient. It is. Yeah. It is it's truly providing holistic care, yeah, certainly right. to the patient, because as a medical institution, we treat the body we right. treat the body, but we have to remember that it's a whole person, and it's body, mind, and spirit. That's right, Jolie. And with that person comes a family. Right, Jolie. So while the person is here, and they're isolated from their family, and mm -hmm. they're going through whatever their fright or fear mm -hmm. or dilemmas are, right. being hospitalized, it's also impacting their family. Jolie. They're Jolie. isolated from their family, they're away from their families, oh, and there's yes. fear and worry, both at home as right. well as in the hospital. I know that when I was in the emergency room, I went to downstate, of course, and I did my training at Kings County, and I was in the emergency room. Uh, you know, sometimes doctors would not consult with the family that's waiting for the patient, you know, but I always made it my business to go out and talk to them, put them at ease, because they don't, when you walk into some place that you don't know anything about, it's a strange and yes. horrible feeling, you know, and then you got somebody that, that's on the edge of something. That's right. So I used to go out and speak with them myself, their families, just sit on the bench with them and then let them come in and see the patients are doing all right. Yes. You know, that this business of pulling a curtain and saying, we, we know what's behind that curtain, but Christ broke the curtain. Ah, uh, <laughs> indeed, indeed. A long time ago. Indeed. And so your training now uh, to be a pastoral uh, minister, it would, was there anything after you finished it? finished your training or at a theological, did you do any specialty, other specialty training in community or uh, ministry or anything like that? A lot of it for me yes. was geared towards pastoral care, but prison ministry training as well. Oh, right. I did both. I did both. I worked with an incredible pastor by the name of Reverend Maria Lopez, oh, who's the chaplain at Bedford her. Hills Correctional yes, Facility I've seen for her. Women, uh -huh. and tremendous training about what happens when the spirit is locked down. Right. What right. happens when the spirit is locked down and families are separated from, from one another. So a lot of that kind of a training yeah, happened yeah. as well. And, and I believe what I call training for the trenches. Mm -hmm. Training for the trenches. I really engage a lot of my time in going into places that aren't popular to pastors. You know, Certainly, The, the yeah. pulpit isn't the only place That's right. to offer God and offer hope. That's right, so I that's find right. myself in prisons, I find myself in homeless shelters, yeah. I find myself in the subways because we have those people still that are living in under the subways. Oh yeah, yeah. You know? and and people have no idea that community. Absolutely not. Children, absolutely. teenagers, all kinds of They're folks. living in the trenches underneath the subways where we walk daily. I know. They're there. They yeah. need ministering. Yeah. They need food, they need hope. Mm -hmm. They need a place to come. They need a, a gap to be bridged for them. And, and I, I believe that God has called me to, to be that person who helps to bridge some of these gaps. Well, you know, in teaching at Downstate here, what I did, I always had my last class in the chapel. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd go to the chapel and have them meet me in the chapel for the last class. Because I said, this will probably be the only time you'll ever visit this chapel. Mm -hmm. But I want to show you how important. What right. it is, you know. Then I would have the rabbi, I would have the uh, Catholic uh, person, and also the uh, Protestant minister yeah. to come and speak to the students, you know, because they come through a medical school and never go into a chapel. That's right. Can you believe that? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, like, like, what are we about here in medical school than to just treat the body? That's right. You know, how are you going to refer? I remember the uh, uh, rabbi. He gave a. Uh, um, a very important service to the medical students. He said, um, this mother was being bothered by her child, you know, and so um, um, he, she gave him a puzzle, a puzzle to put together, you know, and her, um, he, the child finished the puzzle so fast. Uh, uh, it was a puzzle of the world. Okay. 
okay. you know. And he put it so fast, so, uh, fast together. Well, how did you put it together? He said, well, when I turned it over, it was a face of a person. Mm. <laughs> it's easy to make a face of a that's person right, than right. to make all that that's come right. together, right. <laughs> you know. That's and right. so that's the whole purpose, I think, that it's the face. It's that face of the patient that you're not reading, that's right. you know, and, uh, and I mean, there's, I mean, their eyes and their listening and their movements of their face. And very important. Very important. We don't teach that in medical school. Because when you go in and make a statement around a patient, your heart, just like that, you know, your mind is distant, you know. So to have that, and I know when I try to go by your office and you have on your door making rounds. Yes. <laughs> what yes. do you do on your rounds? Oh, absolutely. Just to the point that you've just made in terms of reading the patient's face, a part of pastoral care is listening for what we call the music underneath the words, the okay. music that is coming. Often a patient is saying one thing, but there's something else going on. Yeah. And pastoral care provides a person with the opportunity to just be able to sit and to not only respond to a doctor, but hear what's going on in them. So we ask questions. Mm -hmm. For instance, you, you get a poor prognosis. Right. You've heard it. Your sure. heart is palpitating, all of what's going on in your body. That's right. What are you really feeling? That's right. Sure. What does that make you feel like? Yeah. Where are you now? That's right. And you begin to hear, you really begin to hear the music underneath it. And people often say, I can't believe this is happening to me. Yeah, surely. I, nothing. We can never understand when somebody comes in an emergency room where somebody has suddenly been in an accident That's and right. killed. That's right. And they left home that morning. That's right. And a doctor tells them, well, you know, we'll let you see the patient in, uh, in a few moments, uh, but, uh, you know, to recognize them and so forth. And, that's where that chaplain comes in to the family. Because then. it's more than just what has happened. It's that's what right. did I do to cause this in terms of spiritual care. Oh, yeah, sure. Where is God? That's right. Oh, has yeah. my sins caught up with me? Yeah, surely. Is yeah. it something I've done? Is yeah. it the sins of the father visiting the children? It's oh, all yeah. of those things that become uh, really compacted for that person. And sure. as a pastoral caregiver, it's time to pull that apart. Yeah, oh yes. To get the yes. person to understand that there is meaning in all things. Yeah, surely. But to remove themselves from blame unto hope. Yeah, that's, that's so did. important. That's so important because I, I'm, I'm sure you had that trouble when, you, when a baby dies, yes. for example. Yes, yes. Two, two spectrums, the old person dying, you expect that. Yes. But you don't expect a baby to die. Not at all. You know. Not at all. And so the parent is there. I remember oftentimes our, a child had been run over by a car or something like this. Well, you know, you better be something more than a doctor. That's right. That's right. <laughs> when, they, when you That's see right. those That's people right. come in there and, you know, pouring in there, That's you know, right. and things like that. So I know your job is an emotional, hard job, and you it must is. be tired at night. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. <laughs> but see, they don't yes, think you ever get tired. That's yeah. unfortunate. Yeah. <laughs> they think yeah. doctors or anybody working in the fields of this kind of emotional uh, stress um, gets tired, but you get worn out too. I sure do. You know, because sure your well runs dry. Yes, <laughs> yes. and it often does. It often I know. does. So, what do you do to, to to put more water in your well? Oh, there's so much. There's so much. <laughs> A couple of things that I do: prayer first. Okay. Prayer first. I make certain that I reconnect with my Creator. Mm. Fill my cup, Lord. Fill right. it up. Uh -huh. It's usually my mantra. I usually go before right. the Lord and you know, bread from heaven, feed me till I want no more. And mm -hmm. then after my prayer, I then tend to call up some other clergy folk. There's mm -hmm. some people that I really just need to hear me. Right. I don't need them to minister. I need them to hear my heart, yeah. hear my pain, and hear sure. the laments of the other people that I've been with. Yeah, sure, sure. And then most of all, there is therapy for the therapist. Right. So although I practice and I provide therapy, I also have a therapist that I go to, uh -huh. spiritual care provider, that will pour back into me. It'll help this well to fill up again. But I know you have another therapist that you didn't mention. Who's that? Your daughter. <laughs> you better believe it. <laughs> you better believe it. Your two daughter. Years old. Right? Yes. You know? Yes. She's how old yes. now? Two. Two. She's two. I know that's therapy. Yes. When you yes. walk in the house, everything yes. just drops off, right? Absolutely. Immediately. <laughs> Immediately. <laughs> Immediately. I know, you know, and that's a powerful thing too, family, Absolutely. when you have a family, because a lot of times, uh, our people who are giving care don't have that that's kind right. of care at home themselves, that's you know. Right. And they walk into uh, a home that might be empty or you might not be right. a loved one around them and things like that, you know. Mm -hmm. And so it leads to other negative thinking yes, and so forth, you know. But um, at, at Downstate Medical Center, 
uh, I know you have to deal with the cardiac patients and with the patients who have maybe nervous breakdowns or yes. depression and things like this. And I think we should have a ministry oftentimes in a waiting room. Yes. I just finished writing a very poem about a person who I see every day in the waiting room. It's called, and, uh, and she's very, um, you, you know, you, you see her sitting there all the time. She comes there just to visit, but to sit down around company, you know. Mm. So I was writing a poem called Lady in Waiting. Mm. <laughs> you know? And it's about, you know, these folks that you just pass by. That's right. And you pay no attention to them. We need, well, we need doctors to be exposed to it also. I think the ministry, the doctors, now, I don't know in a hospital such as this even, do they have any kind of service for doctors? Absolutely. They do. Absolutely. Our doctors about tend that. to shy away right, from okay. some of those um, services. Well, one, they're very, very busy. Uh -huh. But two, they're faced with trauma all day, right, most sure. of the day. They're sure. faced with having to, to want to cure folk. That's right. And so they get just as distraught when they can't, when cure is not yeah. and the available. Nurses too. And the nurses. Nurses. And so we often provide, I provide one-on-one -on -one care with the doctors. Oh, that's I good. I provide memorial services mm -hmm. for the entire institution. And I move from unit to unit right. to say in January, you've had 13 losses uh -huh. and it's time to grieve those losses. Right. So we can sit around coffee and we can call the names of those who have either been diagnosed with right. terrible illnesses or those who've died. Right. And the doctors get an opportunity to talk about what some of those struggles were, what they felt at the time, what they don't feel, right, sure. how they feel numb about some of these things. Sure. And we talk about them and, and we get to hear that it's not just death. But then they also talk about all of the wonderful things that are happening. Oh, yes. So we, we, we sit down and, and we're able oh, to talk wonderful. and allow them to pour out, as well right. as the nurses. Well, you know, I had a nurse. She was on one of the wards upstairs. and she, We became good friends. Mm -hmm. And so she said, um, one time a patient was brought in who had a cardiac problem. And they, um, they uh, had a cardiac arrest, in mm -hmm. a sense. But the doctors felt that they were in the if it was an older person who wouldn't go put the time into it, not put the time into it, but, you know, let it go right. as such. Right. So she said that when the doctors left the room and the patient was laying there, she looked at the patient. She said, you're not going to die on my time. And she got on that chest and she started working. And that EKG came up. <laughs> <Absolutely>. <laughs> and the doctors had already told the, patient, the family the patient had passed. <laughs> And they had to come out saying they still alive. That's right. That's right. But that, That's she right. hit. She said. She said. She said that patient was not going to die for no time. That's and right. she put that extra effort and energy into it, and she brought that patient around. So I see sometimes we we give up too fast. We do. We you do. know, we think that oh well. <laughs> no, and a, a part of my role is, is, person is, is talking with physicians about that. Sure. Talking with physicians about this crisis of trust that we have as a people toward doctors and towards how they treat our elders. Oh, yeah. Because we wrestle. I hear it all the time. We wrestle with the fact that just because my 80-year-old grandmother has come in and you believe she's lived her life doesn't mean that you ought to give up. We're not a people who give up very easily. That's right. So we yeah. talk about that. There's yeah. this crisis of trust that sure. we do not believe. These are our matriarchs, and these That's are the right, patriarchs sure. of our family. Oh, so yes. we don't put them away, and we don't expect you to put them away. Well, I had to... I was at a hospital night here, and one of my dear friends was in there who was a very important person in the community. And I saw how the doctors went by them, and I was standing when they went on rounds. They didn't know I was a doctor, you know. Yes. So when they left the room, I went outside and I said, Let me tell you something. You don't know who this person is. You don't know how important right. they are in our That's community. Right. I said, I want the, the chief of medicine to see this patient. Mm -hmm. So I had the chief, Dr. Kermerholtz, his name is, he was here one time in medicine to come up and see the patient and spent an hour at that bedside with that patient with those residents around and that patient got the kind of care they should have got That's right. and they're living today That's right. only because um, they don't know the importance of the patient. I told anybody, if you want to know how important a patient is or was when you took care of them, come to their funeral. Yes. Yes. That's right. Just come to their funeral. That's it. Jewels in our hands. Hundreds of Jewels people. Hundreds of people there. 
That's right. And they just treat it like, oh, that's just another death. Mm -hmm. Hey, it's just not mm -hmm. another death. It's a death that's part right. of a community. You better believe yeah. that. Yeah. That's it. There's a tear in a garment here. That's right. And we feel that. Sure. We feel that. And I, I have to say that we have uh, physicians here who are listening. Yeah. Who really want to understand this community. And I'm right. proud to be here because of that, because they will call me in and say, talk to us uh -huh. about why it is that African Americans resist end of life decision making. Oh, talk yeah. to us right. about what's happening. And, and I can honestly say, well, Doc, it, it has a lot to do with mistrust. That's right. We sure. talk. We talk about Tuskegee and we talk about all of these. Uh, uh, negligence that we feel happened to our people. Surely. We talk about your body languages. We talk mm -hmm. about the double talk. We talk to each other about your talking above our heads and all of those things. Yeah. And, and, and we, we have these conversations in the community. So we want you to sit at the table and join our family. And, right. and I, I have to tell you, doctors are hearing, and I have seen tremendous results here. That's tremendous wonderful. results. Our doctors are talking to our people. Right. Well, asking questions. Because a lot of the doctors have never been exposed to African American people, That's particularly. Right. Uh, like I said, I wouldn't go to China and expect them to be That's accepted right. into their medical field. Mm -hmm. I mean, they take a pulse for some time, 10 minutes rather than 10 seconds. That's right. That's right. <laughs> they take a pulse right. for That's 10 right. minutes and That's tell right. you what's wrong with you, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so all of these kind of things, right. the cultural things, you don't learn. Very In fact, uh, one of my other things was that I. I, I was trying to tell the departments that a doctor coming here in training should never touch a patient until they put on a bus and then make a, 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 a go through the community where yes. they're going to serve. Yes. Because everybody is not at the lower ebb. That's we right. We own brownstones. That's we right. We own this. We have That's this. Right. We have businesses and things like this. That's the only right. thing that person laying on the stretcher looking mm -hmm. disheveled and so forth doesn't have connections. That's right. You know what I mean? That's right. And they would have a different attitude. They would treat them like they, uh, that they come from a beautiful home mm -hmm. and things like that. Mm -hmm. Go and have, I, I, in fact, I think that all physicians should go into a synagogue. Yes. When they're practicing medicine. Of course. They should go into a Baptist church. Absolutely. A storefront church. Absolutely. You know, Catholic church. I agree. And go to a service. And that should be mandatory part of their service. Absolutely. Just to sit and if they went to Concord Understand Baptist Church, who we for are. example. Yes. All they have to yes. do is go once. That's it. <laughs> That's it. And they would change That's their it. whole thing. Oh, yes. to go to the synagogue and sit there at one of their services Absolutely. on a Friday or a Saturday, mm -hmm. you know, and get the feeling of what these right. people are all about. Right. I mean, I, I'm sure many of the African Americans don't know what's going on inside of a synagogue. No. <laughs> you no. know? No. Or vice versa. That's right. You know? That's right. But how are you going to touch a patient's life Unless if you, you go. don't know them? That's right. You know? Go into the village. Understand what's happening. Understand sure. the cultures. Understand the values. Sure. You must. That's right. You must. I think that's what the thing Barack did when he went to Chicago and lived in the yes. projects. Yes. That's why he's going to make a great president. Absolutely. Because he knows what's happening in the Absolutely. projects, whether they were white people or black people living right. in there. He is aware, in touch with the project people. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And so, uh, a good doctor will have to do the same thing. I, I, I look at Albert Schweitzer mm. with the reverence for life, spending yes. all of yes. his life down in yes. uh, Lemurine or Africa. And uh, what he did, uh, he, he was a scholar in music, yes. classical music, all those different things. And yet he spent his life down in Africa there mm -hmm. doing that with very little, but doing the best he could. That's right. you know? and so uh, we have a lot to learn from the elders who yes. are practicing medicine or ministry and things like this, yes. you know, to keep them alive, keep people alive. Absolutely. You know? Yes. Absolutely. In closing, maybe, uh, uh, Reverend Walker, you like to say maybe to our audience or uh, leave a message, when they come to the hospital, what they should request as far as pastoral care. Absolutely, absolutely. It, it's one of the disciplines that really isn't lifted when one comes into the hospital. Right. And when you come into a hospital, you're often, often afraid, isolated, and lonely. Mm -hmm. And it is very important, just as you ask to have your physician you can ask to have a pastoral caregiver. Okay. You can have any pastoral caregiver of your choice. If you're Muslim, we have someone for you. We have right. an imam. If you need the Catholic priest, that priest is here. You need right. a Protestant pastor, that person is here. Right. Remember, it's body, mind, and spirit. Right. And we are here to care for your spirit as you journey with us in this village of care. Yeah. Well, that's wonderful because I think a lot of people overlook that immediately. 
they have nobody they can turn to, That's right. you know, other than their family, you know. And so I think that are up to know that that service is available. Absolutely. Because I, as I said, your door is locked, not because you're in there doing anything, mm -hmm. because you're out of there doing something. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> you know? Make my rounds. <laughs> Making your rounds, Absolutely. you know. And, of course, it, it could be an emergency at any particular yes. time when a family has a, a, a challenge that yes. you're ready to help yes. in that challenge, you know. But I want to thank you, Dr. Thank you. Very thank you for much. having me. Yeah, very wonderful much. having you. Very you folks much. out there, remember, there's yeah. chaplains right here mm -hmm. taking care of the spirit while the doctors and nurses are taking care of that body. But we all have to work together to keep that person alive yeah. and well and let them go home uh, feeling good. <laughs>